Do you know how to see with your eyes closed? This is the Jai Sugra method. We train to master our own mind. On today's podcast, I'm going to share five doors that open with the practice of meditation. These are levels in our consciousness. By doors, think of five worlds or five ways of perceiving or even five realms. Meditation is the culminating practice of my life up to this point, and I'm very enthusiastic to share it with you. I became a seeker early on in life. As a young fella, I kept simply asking question after question, and all of that inquiry brought me to new unfoldings within myself, stage by stage, step by step, breath by breath, to the ultimate life practice of meditation. At age 13, I had a major awakening throughout my whole being when I started learning about my body and its ability to adapt to stress. I had already lived in three different countries and six different cities. It's a mind job for a young kid because moving to new places radically shifts the cultural operating system of one's mind. I was tripping early on because new places have their ways of doing things and unique adaptive responses were called for on my part in each new location. Around the time I hit puberty, I became fascinated by how change occurs and how we can alter our destiny by focusing on the direction we wish to move in. This was because I transformed from a skinny Indian boy with a C-plus GPA into a wiry, muscled scholar-athlete in only one year. At this very young age, I started to experiment more and more, mainly with my body and later with my mind. I have never stopped. I wanted to know what else was possible. What was the ceiling? Was there more? All of my prodding and poking of the world and the different layers of reality got more and more profound with each new decade of my life. The teachers always appeared to guide me when I was ready. When I was ready to explore a new layer of consciousness or reality. So the onion kept getting peeled back layer by layer by life experiences and those who had walked the path of truth and inquiry longer than me. I was able to learn because I always surrendered to masters when I found them. I could recognize a master by their level of discipline. I had seen the energy of discipline in my father, and subconsciously it became a required characteristic for anyone that I would let teach me. I always felt that someone had to have self-control if they were to lead me. Focus and concentration are the fruits of a disciplined practice done uninterrupted over a long period of time. I'm super passionate about and feel very inspired by meditation, its immediate rewards, and long-term potential benefits. Our mind is like a muscle. With consistent training, we can direct our thoughts so that we attain more inner peace. On a more long-term level, if we keep our brain in shape with old age, meditation can prevent neurodegenerative disease. Meditation can be looked at in two ways, first as a practice, but also as a state. As a practice, imagine bringing the body to sitting posture and being able to keep it still, totally motionless. Under that stillness would be an inner awareness where you simply allow thoughts to rise and fall without being attached to or identified with them. It is then that the mind can begin to quiet itself or to slow down completely. As a practice, meditation can be woven into our life seamlessly. It is most potent and fruitful when done in the morning after taking a shower. As a state, imagine meditation to be quieting the mind to a depth that is absolutely indescribable by words. It is like perceiving the space in between thoughts, if you can imagine such a gap. This is what the ancient texts describe as resolving the mind back to its source 
so that you fully experience your spirit. The state of meditation is what lies beyond thought. Masters of the past tell us that this is where we find spirit. As a state, meditation can be pure bliss. Now, enlightenment is a different animal altogether. If you're aiming for enlightenment, this is your final lifetime, and it requires a lot of effort. Enlightenment as a goal takes incredible commitment and devotion. You must be willing to give decades of your life to serious, uninterrupted contemplation. There are many activities in life that have a meditative quality. To me, any time you're fully concentrated or totally focused on the moment or what is before you, it takes on the quality of meditation. Some of my long runs and races have been extremely meditative. Skiing, maximal lifts at the gym, martial arts where you could get hit in the face, things where you're really focused and have that concentration take on a meditative quality. Let's take a look at what Wikipedia says about meditation or how it defines meditation from the popular point of view. According to Wikipedia, meditation is a practice where the individual uses a technique such as mindfulness or focusing the mind on a particular object, thought, or activity to train attention and awareness and achieve a mentally clear and emotionally calm and stable state. I really like that definition, especially the part about having an object. It doesn't have to be one particular object as long as you have an object. My favorite object of concentration is the breath. It's non-religious, it's extremely practical, and it's with us all the time. So remember, meditation is a practice. That's where we sit and concentrate, but it's also a state which is indescribable by words. Words lose their meaning in the true state of meditation. I'm eager today to open the five doors of meditation with you, and at the conclusion of our experience, I will close with a list of benefits that regular meditation practice gives you if you were to take to it. Quieting the mind opens five doors. The first is the door to the spiritual sky. Now, what do I mean by the spiritual sky? Before I really define this place that we can guide ourselves to or imagine ourselves to or focus ourselves to or associate ourselves to, let's look at what keeps us from being able to sit still with ourselves. What is actually beneath the surface? Now, some of us drink too much coffee or our nature is naturally hyperactive. This is obviously a simple obstacle. When we start sitting, we can see some very dark stuff with our eyes closed. For most people, sitting still is hard work. And it's because we have a hard time being comfortable in our own skin. You see, I believe we each have three sides to ourselves. We each have a public life, a private life, and a hidden or secret life. The public life is our perfectly curated version of ourselves. Think of your social feed or how you present yourself at a gathering where other people's opinion of you really matters. Our private life is our trauma, our fears, our incongruence, and the things that make us feel frustrated. We try to put that away and tuck it away from the public eye. The hidden life is our shadow and perhaps the collective mind. What I mean by that is deep underneath the surface are parts of ourselves that we haven't looked at. It's stuff that's hidden from our own awareness and can be very scary. Think of our demons. Think of an idea like suicidal thoughts, an eating disorder a propensity towards violent thoughts or images. Think of Jeffrey Epstein and how long it took for him to cross the boundary of thought into actual monstrous action for real. 
How early in life did he start having seedy thoughts before acting on them? And where does monstrosity like that come from? Now, if we sit with ourselves, many of us would be in jail if all of our thoughts were actually broadcasting on a public channel that everyone could see. The hate, for example, that people expressed over Donald Trump Even after the election, the vitriol, the anger, the rage that was inside of people, I believe that hate resides inside of them. Somewhere inside of them are folks that were not hugged by their fathers as a child. We each have a shadow or a really dark side that needs to be seen and needs to be acknowledged or else it rears its ugly head. And we each, in this way, have demons or things that we battle. I met a young woman once who had an incestuous relationship with her own biological father and got pregnant from the experience. The intensity of such an experience made it hard for her to even look in the mirror honestly at herself. The shame she felt needed a lot of focus and cleaning. It was hidden deep down inside of her. On my own journey, I've met a lot of people who struggle with alcoholism and feel that it's in their DNA and has been handed down through their family lineage. And some of the most influential people I've met over the years, including billionaires and celebrities, some of the people we admire most behind closed doors When the lights go down, they were actually very sad, lonely, and insecure people. Some of the most desperate people you could ever imagine. This is why sometimes we will see inspiring figures like Anthony Bourdain take their own lives. And so we each have a shadow, a hidden side of ourselves. We each have a private side, and we each have this public side, and we have a a sort of cloud, an accumulation of things that we struggle with. Imagine taking all of your problems, all of the things that plague you and bring you down, and put them in one cloud. Now, soar above your body, leave your body where it is, and if you could fly high up and bring that cloud high up into the sky and let the cloud just float high in the sky... In the spiritual sky, when you look around above everybody else's head, you'll see that each person has their own cloud. Everyone struggles, but in a unique and fascinating way. And so this perspective, when we meditate and we sit through the pain, we sit through the darkness, we sit through our incongruences, we feel itching on the body and twitching and pain, but we move ahead breath by breath with our mindfulness practice and we process the pain of sitting still, we'll see that others struggle just like us. And in this way, our problems are not all that deeply personal. So sitting with all the sides of yourself, including the shadow, the hidden, the stuff that's beneath the surface, opens the door to the spiritual sky where a beautiful sense of unity lies for any meditator. You just have to stick it out through those hard parts in the beginning. Meditation also opens the door to infinite life. This is the place that exists. This is the place in our perception that opens up when we no longer have the fear of death. You see, I believe when we die, our body will dissolve. But the body made of our actions, or karma, does not dissolve and carries on to another dimension called akasha, a different vibratory frequency, an alternate reality, or subtle realm. And then we slide back into this game to attain a new body that can help us fulfill our unresolved actions, our unresolved fears, our unresolved traumas, 
And our body allows us the opportunity to be in the game of life or the school of life so that we learn to align all the parts of ourselves grounded in the spiritual reality. The door to infinite life helps us develop compassion for all. When we are very fortunate and stick through the good practices and the bad practices, the practices that agitate us and the practices that give us bliss, and we attain a consistency one day, one day, similar to having a runner's high or a yoga high, one day we resolve the mind back to its source and calm it to the point where we experience a meta position. We get in touch with the I am Brahman mantra, the I am God mantra beyond the ego. If we step beyond the sense of I or sense of ego, we see that the spiritual experience is the same for all living beings, that underneath body, underneath mind is spirit, and we develop a compassion for all of life. This is to understand the concept of great spirit or cosmic consciousness. Infinite life or the door to infinite life would imply that Every action matters now. What I do now will have a boomerang effect. It will come right back to me. There was this time a few years ago on a cold winter day in the middle of February when I was walking to see a client at 6 a.m. And I saw a large rat stuck in a giant glue trap on the sidewalk. You see, it had escaped the garbage chute and was running away but became exhausted and had almost freed itself from the glue trap. And it was shrieking and, and, and yearning to live. Its will to live was strong, but its energy was becoming exhausted. And the amount of suffering in the air as it was shrieking at the top of its lungs was so excruciating. It stopped me in my tracks and it made me wonder very deeply as I tried to help the rat, there was a sense of risk. Like if it became free, its energy started to turn towards me and it could have bit me and it may have been a rabbit rat. So I just stood there after trying to help. I backed off and just looked at the rat and it made me explore my teaching on a very deep circular level. I began to wonder what was this rat's last life? How did this rat get to be in this position of great suffering, of this position of eating only trash, in this position of having to feed its hungry belly constantly in a concrete jungle? I began to wonder at the causes for this rat's birth. And it's something that stuck with me for a really long time, and it's embedded in my memory, and it inspires my practice, and it inspires my memory of who I am from the times that I've been lucky enough to slow down my mind and experience the door to infinite life. I believe the perception of infinite life means we are finally playing with a full deck. You see... It means we understand all the parts of the puzzle. For me, I can't fully, fully surrender and trust someone if they do not have this knowledge. I think they are living with a partial awareness of reality, so I don't open up fully to someone, all the parts of myself, until I know that this door has also opened up in their consciousness. It means we're literally running with an updated operating system. The third door that opens up with meditation is the door to the peace that passes all understanding. You see, meditation has one key amazing mind-blowing benefit. Meditation helps to develop the prefrontal cortex in our brain. This is the area that helps us with impulse control. Now imagine what would happen if you could control lower drives like 
an addiction to sugar, an addiction to pornography, an addiction to video games. We all know on one cognizing common sense level that doing these things too much or even partaking in them can be destructive. But the practice of meditation allows us to train new habits while allowing parting ways with unhealthy habits. This level of self-control makes the mind tranquil. It could bring us to a place where we feel absolutely nothing is missing, nothing can be added, and that we are whole and complete as we are in the moment of perceiving ourselves as complete. We have all of the resources we need, but when the mind is turned outwards, there is no end to human desire. Impulse control and sticking to a goal through the painful parts of discipline will yield a new type of satisfaction. It can literally reform the image of ourselves in our mind. And this influences greatly who we become in the world and how we show up for our communities in the world. The deepest peace I've known have come from experiences on silent retreat. When I go on silent retreat, there's always one, two, or three tough days on the journey. But by sticking out those hard and difficult parts, I achieve a silence that reflects my true nature to me. And this is the greatest bliss. And what I try to do is to code that deep into my memory for my negotiations in the day-to-day life. You see, the perceived demands of a situation are actually not as great as the actual demand. So we always have this mental vacillation of how things are going to be. We worry quite unnecessarily. With awareness, we learn to hang the correct frame around social situations so as to downregulate stress and attain that deep peace that passes all understanding. If this door opens up for you in your practice, code it, code it, code it way down in the subtle body so that you can adjust yourself in relationship to reality by calling on this resource at a time that would ordinarily stress you out. The fourth door that opens with meditation is the door to interpreting totems or symbols. I want to tell you a story by a shaman named Hashuma. He shared a vision of our ancestors, the first primates that stood up that started to look for meaning and understanding. Now imagine this. A long, long, long time ago in our ancestral past, perhaps through war or an accident, Our ancestors saw a body laying and started to investigate this body that once had life. And they are seeing it stiff in a state of rigor mortis, heavy, bound to the earth, and wondering where the animating force has gone. And so perhaps they opened the body up, focusing on the center of the body and looking at it in terms of three boxes. The limbs are distal. The highway is the spine. So they were looking on these three boxes. So in the lower region, the pelvic region and the abdomen, they use the symbol of the snake. The snake has a side-to-side energy, similar to digestion, and it can rise through the central channel. Perhaps this could be a rudimentary expression of the first chakra system. These are maps that represent realities. And maps don't always match the territory, but they help us navigate the space. Now, in the area at the chest, our ancestors placed the image of the large cat, the jaguar, the tiger, a large jungle cat. Think of 
the lion-hearted. Think of courage. Think of the pulsating heartbeat of a warrior, the self-control, the calmness, the coiling of energy, the expression of energy. This is related to the heart, the pulsating, the beating heart. And for this, they use an animal without predator. And in the head, think of the bird's eye view being high up on the mountain and looking down at the valley. For this, our ancestors used the condor or the eagle, the one with wings spread wide and soaring, looking down to finer points. So we have always been connected to nature in this way and interpreting the world around us. The greatest mantra, one of the grand pronouncements in the Vedic tradition of India is Aham Brahmasmi. This grand pronouncement is literally I am Brahman or I am God. This is not thinking of Jai. This is what happens when we sift away the name and form, what is left is the Bri. The Bri is the ever-expanding awareness. Whatever we can perceive, we are that. I am God. I am Brahman. This is a literally a meta-positioning. It positions you as the one. And in this sense, one can communicate and co-create with reality. I had a 10-year gap where I had an inversion of numbers, inversion of the street with New York City addresses. Let me tell you about this quick story in a 10-year gap. You see, when I was 33 years old, I lived in an apartment on the Upper West Side, 43 West 85th Street. It was an incredible apartment, a duplex, two levels, two bathrooms. It was my first adult apartment, and it was a great period of my life. It was the most financially fruitful uh, area, time of my life up to that point. And I lived right outside of Central Park on a street that was a transverse to the park. Now, 10 years later, I was in a position to move and I had some really great options, but then I called my old management company and they said to me, you know, we have an apartment and it's on 34 West 85th Street, Apartment A. Now, I want to repeat the apartment from 10 years ago. It was also on 85th Street, but it was number 43. And the new apartment was number 34, which are inversions of each other. And I knew before I showed up that the apartment would be absolutely perfect and that I would get it and take it and live blissfully in joy sitting on my couch and looking out the window and seeing number 43 right across from me on the opposite side of the street. And this was symbolic of my 10-year deepening spiritual journey where I literally was able to transcend my mind and go to the other side. So the universe on the outside put me on the other side of the street. I was able to recognize the importance of these numbers inverting in a 10-year period and listen by following the signs. There are signs around us all the time. All we have to do is open our eyes and look at them. I can tell you story after story of signs, interpreting signs, and following the signs. But all I can say is when one meditates, the door to totems and symbols open up in a way that you can receive guidance from your own self in a higher dimension. It's about interpreting the clues and putting them in a useful, resourceful context. The fifth door that opens with meditation is the door in between dimensions or the door to different timelines. You see, this is the ability to download information from other realms when you decide to walk different timelines. I study a text called the Yoga Sutras. 
And book four of the Yoga Sutras, you know, it's an ancient text written by Master Patanjali that we look for clues on how to do our spiritual practice and clues on how to train and direct our mind. And in the opening of book four, Master Patanjali talks about different varying ways to attain yogic accomplishments or meditative concentration. These are super perceptive powers, deep understandings, and they are very mystical. Now he says, one can be born with yogic accomplishments or they can arise through drugs, mantra, or intense spiritual practice or sadhana. You see, imagine being able to trade in a lousy habit for a resourceful habit. What if you were an alcoholic that parted ways with drinking? You would literally, over the next 10 years, become a completely different person. People that I know that are fortunate enough to have a near-death experience, and I've had three, they always come back with incredible clarity and gratitude, crystal clear clarity about their purpose going forward. Each saint was once a sinner. The path to transformation starts with that first mindful sit. Meditation can heal the alcoholic or the murderer the same. We do not have to stay the same. With practice, we come to variable ways of perceiving and can choose to literally step into different timelines and become a transformed human being on all levels. Meditation is a capacity of mind that is available to everyone. So I hope in listening to these five doors that it sparks a sense of curiosity in you. I hope it sparks a willingness to experiment with the practice and to find ways that can help you attain more peace by taking contemplative practice. It is through reflection and understanding that we come to align all the parts of ourselves, including the seen and the unseen. I'd like to now share 12 benefits that come with regular meditation practice. Number one, meditation is great for reducing stress. Just simply think of the power of slowing down and paying attention to your thought process and reducing the speed of your thoughts. This would have a catalytic effect on your capacity to become grounded in the present moment. Number two, meditation is great for building up your prefrontal cortex. We talked about this already, but it's responsible for controlling your impulses and your personal level of self-discipline. Number three, because of this, you can stick to your positive habits better with less wavering. Number four, meditation will improve your performance at work, in sports, and in your relationships. Number five, meditation makes you relaxed and happy in the moment right now. Number six, meditation will improve your decision-making because you are more relaxed. Number seven, meditation is good for your brain health. MRI and fMRI studies look at the brains of monks, people who have normal brains, and cancer tumor brains. What they find out is that the health of the brain improves by how much it is used. By meditating, we strengthen the structures of the brain. Training it is literally making it stronger. Number eight, when you meditate, you reduce the level of brain degeneration with age. You reduce things like memory loss because you are using many parts of your brain. This prevents Alzheimer's disease. Number nine, meditation moderates the production of cortisol the primary stress hormone in the body that has a catabolic or breakdown effect. 10. Meditation lowers your blood pressure. 
Number 11, meditation helps with pain control. We see this with people who practice Wim Hof breathing and cold training therapy. They often find that they have a greater capacity or threshold for pain when they really focus their minds and focus on their breathing. Number 12, meditation will improve your love life. With increased awareness comes more creativity, more compassion, and variable ways of perceiving that when applied to the art of togetherness can really turn up the volume on all levels. Thanks so much, guys, for tuning into the podcast today. It was my hope to show you the power in sticking with a practice that might be difficult and have its hard days and easy fun days. It's my hope that you would take to some level of consistent sitting practice because I believe the world is transforming at an incredible pace and being positioned inside at this time allows for great intuitive decision making. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can support this work by being a contributor to my Patreon. Just go to patreon.com backslash Jai Sugrim. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com backslash Jai Sugrim. You can find out more about my work and offerings on my website, jaisugrim.com, J-A-I-S-U-G-R-I-M.com. Thanks so much for listening today, guys. Thank you and have a great day.